Okay, hello, welcome to lecture 20. I can't believe we've got to 20. Uh, time flies. Um, so in the last lecture, I warned you against uh, certain prejudices that may cloud your appreciation for Marx's ideas. Um, today, we're going to spool back uh, to uh, the formation of uh, Marx's political ideas and talk a little bit about the intellectual background uh, against which uh, his initial uh, uh, philosophical uh, approach is forged. Um, and this requires uh, some appreciation, uh, especially of his early encounter with the dominant German philosopher of the early 19th century, uh, G.W.F. Hegel. Uh, there he is, handsome fellow. Um, unfortunately, um, Hegel is virtually incomprehensible. Uh, when I teach... Um, 3020 in a regular semester, I would uh, include more of Hegel's writings and would have to spend a lot more time on him than I am uh, going to uh, this semester. Um, and so I'm going to try uh, to demystify as best I can um, Hegel's ideas. Hopefully it will be enough uh, to help you uh, navigate the short excerpt uh, from the uh, lectures on the philosophy of history that I asked you to read this week. Uh, that's a really tough reading. If you're struggling with it, uh, don't, don't worry about it. I'm sorry to report that if you think that's tough, then other writings of Hegel are even uh, worse. Um, uh, hopefully, what I'm going to be able to achieve in this lecture is to give you something of an entree uh, into Hegel's very distinctive uh, and very hard to understand uh, general approach. Um, it's important to understand Hegel because he was a huge influence on Marx, uh, although, as you'll see at the end of this lecture, uh, Marx breaks with Hegel's approach in some important ways. He remains, in many respects, right to the end, uh, a loyal uh, Hegelian. Uh, what uh, Marx attempts to do, as you perhaps know, uh, is to take Hegel's highly idealistic uh, approach to philosophical speculation uh, and to transform some of his insights and reframe them within a materialist uh, uh, view. So eventually uh, Marx is going to uh, materialize Hegel uh, and offer a materialist theory of history, uh, politics, and economics um, albeit of uh, a, a new and very distinctive uh, kind. Um, and so I want in today's lecture and some of the early lectures next week to explain what this materialist turn in, in Marx really amounts to. But to really understand that, you've, you've got to see it against the background of Hegelian idealism. Um, and so uh, my aim today is to try to orient you as best I can uh, to uh, Hegel's idealistic um, uh, approach. Um, we've encountered materialism, of course, already in Hobbes. You'll remember that uh, Hobbes uh, has this rigorously uh, materialist uh, conception uh, in which uh, the universe is nothing but matter in motion, uh, and we are included within that uh, manifold of uh, material substance. Uh, so uh, you'll remember that Hobbes rejects decisively, breaks with uh, the Cartesian picture of human beings being uh, uh, partly physical beings, but also, uh, and more importantly, uh, mental or spiritual uh, beings with an immaterial uh, soul. Hobbes rejects that. Marx makes a very, very similar move in the context of, of, of Hegel. But uh, he retains some important themes from Hegel. He thinks that Hegel is on to something, uh, especially with regard to the historical, temporal quality of, of philosophical understanding. And so one way to think about Marx's ideas, especially for the formation of his early thought, is to see him as accepting something like the sort of materialism that we encountered in Hobbes, uh, but putting a Hegelian twist on it, recovering some of Hegel's major insights, uh, but reframing them uh, within a, a, a materialist uh, paradigm. So that's, that's where we're going. That's the purpose uh, of, of this lecture, to orient you uh, 
uh, to the Hegelian influence on, on Marx, because you're not really going to understand Marx's uh, distinctive approach, I think, unless you have some kind of handle on that uh, uh, Hegelian background. Now, Hegel is part of uh, the 19th century counter-enlightenment. You, you know by now the Enlightenment is this period of the flourishing of science uh, and rational speculation of one sort, uh, of one sort or another. Um, and uh, in the 19th century, it actually begins really in the late 18th century, and in a way, Rousseau's second discourse uh, and his depiction of the noble savage uh, is an important uh, part of this, begins already in the 18th century, uh, a kind of uh, reaction against uh, uh, the Enlightenment, and, and, and that reaction is very often associated correctly with uh, the Romantic uh, movement. Central figures in the Romantic movement in Germany are figures like Herder, Novalis, Hölderlin, uh, uh, Friedrich, you've probably got um, some of, you've seen some of Friedrich's um, uh, uh, paintings, you know, pictures of these uh, heroes on rocks above a sea of cloud and so forth. Uh, in England, of course, you have the Romantic poets, figures like Wordsworth and Coleridge. Uh, uh, it's a general movement that sweeps through uh, 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 culture during this period, and it represents a, a reaction against uh, some of the major themes of Enlightenment uh, rationalism. Uh, for me, in, 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 I'm, I, I'm very interested in the history of music. Uh, those of you who know anything about Western music, Beethoven is a key figure in the shift uh, of musical culture in the West to a more romantic outlook. And for me anyway, uh, the, the decisive uh, uh, moment in the development of uh, uh, romanticism in music uh, is Beethoven's third symphony, his Eroica symphony, which is all about heroes and specifically uh, about Napoleon. It, it, it's, a, it's a symphony with a program. And the second movement in particular, the famous Funeral March, which, you, which if you haven't heard it, you should. It's an astonishing piece of music. And, and, and compared with what came before, it's more or less un, unprecedented. So if you, if you want to spend a little bit of time uh, uh, edifying yourself, you could uh, just listen to a recording uh, of the second movement of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's a towering landmark in the development of uh, romantic music. Um, modern Romanticism, which, as I say, is as much a cultural as a philosophical phenomenon, it represents a turn away from the Enlightenment, a turn away especially from science, scientific forms of understanding, highly analytic forms of rationality, mechanistic uh, understandings of the world, and it accordingly tends to emphasize the importance in human life of emotion, sponta spontaneity, uh, freedom, free self-expression. Uh, it, 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 it likes to celebrate nature and the organic uh, uh, in aesthetics. It's fascinated by emotions that it associates with the sublime, feelings of awe and wonder in the face of things that we can't fully understand. Um, uh, in this course, of course we've already uh, encountered uh, uh, the influence of the Romantics and the Romantic movement in Mill. I think, you know, his, his nervous breakdown, his recovery from his nervous breakdown, uh, his discovery within himself of powerful emotional commitments, uh, no question that that turn away from a kind of Benthamite reaction against a very Benthamite mechanistic view of human motivation. Um, uh, Mill's turn away from that, certainly influenced by this uh, broader romantic uh, shift in culture that happens at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th. And Hegel is part of all of that. Um, on the philosophical side, uh, 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 perhaps the major theme of uh, the Romantic movement, its major impact, is to encourage a rebellion against various kinds of sharp oppositions that the Romantic thinkers tended to assume that the Enlightenment had encouraged, particularly oppositions between reason and passion, or rational reflection and emotion, uh, sharp oppositions between the observer and the observed, between subjects and objects, abstract, concrete, part, whole, self-society, necessity, the world of causation, the, the world of compulsion, 
uh, and and freedom and the world of spontaneity, right? Um, uh, one of the problems with Enlightenment thinking, say the Romantics, is that they tend to reinforce these sharp binaries. And a major theme in philosophical Romanticism is the attempt to overcome uh, these sharp binaries and oppositions and try to come up with uh, a way of thinking, a way of thinking philosophically uh, that is attuned to the way in which they are, in fact, integrated with each other. They're seamlessly uh, uh, connected. This is one of the reasons why the Romantics are fascinated by the phenomena uh, of music and especially dance, right? In a dance, uh, there is, yes, a certain kind of organization, uh, a certain kind of rationality, if you will. There are certain uh, uh, rules that you have to follow in, a, in different kinds of dances, in a, uh, a, in a jig, in a, in, a, in a tango, in a waltz, right? But, but if, you're, if you're just thinking about the rules and following the uh, expectations, the formal expectations, you're sort of missing the point of the dance. The dance is at the same time uh, uh, something that comes to life in a complete integration of emotion and uh, formality. Um, and, and it's that attempt to reintegrate uh, aspects of human experience and aspects of human life that the Enlightenment had tended to hive off as separate, sharply opposed uh, modes of activity and experience. Uh, that, that reintegration project uh, is central to uh, the Romantic uh, uh, move. And Hegel shares all of this and how he does this in his own very distinctive view will hopefully become clear in the course of the um, uh, lecture. Uh, like other Romantics, he rejects two specific ideas about the structure of especially philosophical understanding, both of which Hegel and the other Romantics believed were mistakenly, misguidedly encouraged uh, in the uh, Enlightenment. And I want to talk a little bit about each of these in the coming uh, uh, section of the lecture. Uh, the first, I'll just uh, mention it now, is uh, uh, Hegel wants to reject uh, a certain view about rational reflection, uh, which he thinks co is common to many Enlightenment thinkers and much modern understanding, um, in which the, when you engage in rational reflection, you repair to certain static definitions uh, or conceptualizations that are abstracted excessively from the dynamic flux of events uh, in the world. And I'll say more about how Hegel breaks with that uh, way of thinking about rationality in a moment. Um, the second theme in Enlightenment uh, philosophy that, it, that, that, that Hegel and the other Romantics decisively uh, reject uh, is a certain conception of the rational of rationality and rational understanding uh, that emphasizes especially scientific and empirical observation of physical material objects, the attempt to generalize from merely observational data about the world. Uh, again, uh, Hegel and the Romantics, and I'll say a little bit more about this second theme uh, 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 a little bit later on, uh, Hegel wants to say that that's, that that's the wrong way to approach philosophy. Science doesn't give you the right model you need a different kind of model, and I'll, I'll explain what Hegel means by that in a moment. So let me say a little bit about each of these two uh, themes that Hegel breaks with and rejects uh, in turn. Um, the first of these themes um, uh, is what gives Hegel his distinctively dialectical conception of philosophical reflection. Uh, dialectic is a, a, a pretentious word, um, and I'm going to try to demystify it a little bit. The key contrast here is dialectical versus static uh, conceptions of uh, reason and understanding and rational uh, reflection. So uh, at this first stage, Hegel wants to reject the idea that our, our, our rational reflection is populated uh, largely by inherently static or timeless concepts from which we deduce certain logical uh, conclusions. Hegel thinks that way of thinking about uh, philosophical rationality is a profound mistake. Um, if you want an example of someone we've encountered who uh, uh, fits the bill of the, of the view that Hegel decisively wants to reject, 
uh, go back to Hobbes in the early stages of Leviathan. You'll remember, and I tried to emphasize this in some of my earlier lectures, uh, Hobbes uh, operates with a, a, a geometrical conception of reason and reasoning. You see him in the early stages of Leviathan trying to define terms. He's isolating certain purely abstract definitions uh, in words, and he regards those definitions as, uh, explicitly regards them, as timeless or eternal, and, and, and then seeks to draw timeless and eternal conclusions by deducing proofs uh, from primitive uh, axioms. And these then describe uh, the logical relationships between various abstractly defined uh, concepts. This, again, is, of course, as you all know, the way that standard Euclidean geometry and a lot of mathematics uh, operates. And uh, Hegel thinks that's the wrong model to apply, especially if you're doing social and political uh, uh, philosophy. But uh, uh, Hegel actually radicalizes that and thinks that it's a mistake uh, with regard to philosophical understanding uh, tout court. Uh, remember, again, Hobbes, he says, look, all matter is finite. It's, it's uh, bound in time and space. Uh, it's part of a flux. But names... Uh, the kinds of uh, definitions that you give in your philosophical uh, analysis, they're everlasting, right? Once you've defined a term in a certain kind of way, once you've defined a triangle, uh, as Pythagoras defined a triangle, or as Euclid defined a triangle, or as Euclid defined a, a line, right? The shortest different, the distance between two points uh, that has no breadth, right? That definition is everlasting. It's eternal. It doesn't have any determinate position in space or time. These are pure abstractions. And the model of philosophy and philosophical understanding is the model of logical deduction within that world of, of abstractly defined, timeless, everlasting conceptualizations. And that's the view that Hegel's dialectical approach uh, strives to get away from and break with. Um, so uh, in rejecting that approach, uh, 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 Hegel wants to say you've got to understand rationality as inherently dynamic and temporal. It has a time-bound, historical, chronological uh, element to it, which is it, completely in, in, in ineliminable. Um, uh, to demystify this idea, consider the idea of an argument, right? Um, I mean, we could, I think, all agree look, uh, philosophical reasoning is about argumentation. It's about making arguments, or it's about having an argument. It doesn't really matter. You might be talking about uh, uh, the argument of a book. You might be talking about an argument between two people. You might be talking about uh, a debate or an argument uh, that is uh, uh, being had implicitly uh, in uh, uh, some world historical event, like a, a, an election, uh, or, or, a, or even a war, right? You could think of the American Civil War as, in some sense, uh, a, an argument about uh, slavery, as historians often uh, put it, as, as, as a historical event that resolved the question of the uh, status of uh, slavery as an institution in American life. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about uh, uh, an argument in words or an argument in a debate uh, or an argument that is, is as it were, um, spelled out and developed in a series of historical events. Um, all of these ideas of an argument, which I think intuitively you would agree, has some element of rationality to it. Uh, all of these ideas of an argument involve some chronological process, some to and fro, right? If you're reflecting yourself uh, on your own beliefs, right, you're, you, there's a kind of inner speech, uh, and you're arguing to and fro introspectively uh, about uh, what you think, right? Uh, in the historical cases, if a society is trying to work out its view of an institution like slavery, right? You can think of it as having an argument with itself about whether it wants or doesn't want to live with 
the institution of slavery, uh, or the argument of a book, right? If we think about a book making a philosophical argument, uh, a book like Hobbes's Leviathan, it's an attempt to move the reader to a conclusion. And the important word there is move, right? Uh, the, the argument of a book attempts to take the reader uh, and shift their thinking in a certain kind of way. And you can't, Hegel thinks, understand that notion of a shift in thinking without implicitly assuming some uh, chronological process. You, there's the you before you pick up the book, and then there's the you after you've read the book. If the, if the argument of the book has succeeded, uh, the book will have moved you to a different conclusion, or at least led you to modify your initial uh, uh, assumptions. And, and if, you, if you can get that idea, you're on the way, uh, I, I think, to uh, grasping what Hegel means when he thinks of rationality and reason as temporal uh, rather than timeless. Uh, because what Hegel wants to do, and it's a very radical thought, it's a very difficult thought for us, uh, he wants to generalize that idea and say that all reason, all philosophical understanding, all rationality is like that. Rationality is always something that happens, right? It's always stretched across time, it's always stretched across history. And you can't, uh, if, if, if you want to engage in rational reflection, uh, you can't try to step outside time and specify pure, timeless, abstract concepts, because rationality is a kind of motion in thought. It spreads itself through time. It's something we do uh, temporarily. Um, and that's the sense in which reason for Hegel and also eventually for Marx is dialectical, right? I mean, it, it involves uh, a conversation, uh, implicit perhaps, uh, but nonetheless some to and fro, some kind of debate, some kind of dispute in which claims are being advanced and then in time reflected upon and then in time modified or eliminated or abandoned. Right. Uh, so this word uh, dialectic, it's a it's, it's a big fat philosophical word, but in a way it means something relatively basic. It just it just means that rationality is conversational. Uh, it's a matter of uh, shifting people's beliefs and, and, and views over time. And it doesn't matter, as I've said, uh, whether we're talking just about a, a kind of introspective uh, form of thinking. Uh, even that is going to be bound by time because you're going to think about things introspectively, contemplatively, in time in a certain way. Or it doesn't, or, or whether we're talking about rational arguments between people uh, or between groups of institutions uh, in social and historical life. Uh, uh, rationality, argument are always time bound. Uh, processes. And that's an absolutely central uh, Hegelian uh, uh, conception. The second theme that I mentioned earlier, which I'm going to talk about now, is uh, uh, this reaction against purely scientific or empirical or observational ways of grasping and apprehending the world. Um, and we've seen this over and over again in this class. We began the semester with Francis Bacon saying, look, if you want to get clear about the world, what you've got to do is to interrogate it doing experiments, right? You, you observe the world and you draw general inductive conclusions by observing data and forming valid hypotheses that you then test by experimentation to draw more general conclusions about the way the world works. Um, and that's, of course, been the dominant way of thinking about science and philosophy for most of the 17th and 18th century. It's what makes modern political and philosophical and scientific thinking uh, distinctive, a commitment to this. You see it after Bacon in Newton, uh, in Galileo. On the philosophical side, you see that view being uh, proposed uh, and encouraged by Hume and Kant. Uh, on this kind of view, which becomes central to the Enlightenment, we can fully understand and explain everything we need to understand about the world, including human conduct, human activity, human social practices, uh, on the basis of empirical scientific ob uh, observation. And Bentham, of course, represents in many ways the apotheosis of this sort of approach in the human sciences, right? You do you 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 do good psychology. You figure out the clockwork uh, that animates uh, human motivation. Um, uh, you apply the utility principle uh, and use it as uh, a device for social reform. You try to uh, think about what makes human beings happy. You figure that out empirically, um, and 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 then you try to devise uh, reforms 
uh, new institutions, uh, modifications of existing institutions, such that uh, we promote uh, uh, the welfare of, of, of everyone. And, and, and that's, of course, an absolutely standard Enlightenment view. And this is the second view that Hegel wants to uh, break with, because Hegel regards this, as he would say, objectifying view uh, of uh, scientific and philosophical understanding as a complete uh, mistake. And the central intuition here, I take it, is that for Hegel, uh, human activity involves action for reasons. But if you want to understand that activity and the sense in which human agents uh, do what they do for their own reasons, you have to understand those reasons in, a, in an interpretative way. Uh, it's no good trying to explain why, say, Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment by you know, taking uh, Dostoevsky, uh, of course you couldn't have done this in the 19th century, but this is perhaps a helpful illustration. If you took Dostoevsky as he was composing and thinking about how to write Crime and Punishment, stuck him in an fMRI um, and, and made a list of all of the brain states uh, that were manifest in um, Dostoevsky's mind as he was going through the process of composing and writing uh, Crime and Punishment. It would give you a lot of true statements uh, about uh, Dostoevsky's neurology, uh, but Hegel thinks, and surely there's something right about this, uh, this would tell us absolutely nothing about Dostoevsky's actual motivations in writing the book, why he wrote it the way he did, what point he was trying to make, uh, why he used certain metaphors for certain kinds of ideas, uh, and so on and so forth. To understand why Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment, you have to interpret his activity, his literary accomplishments, in terms of his goals, his self-understanding, uh, his trying to work out certain human issues in prose, in a literary form. Um, and to do this, you have to think of, uh, you have to, as it were, enter Dostoevsky's point of view and ask yourself, if you were Dostoevsky, why would you have written this book uh, with these characteristics for these reasons? Uh, and Hegel thinks, following a lot of the Romantic thinkers, you're never going to be able to provide the required kind of explanation by thinking of Dostoevsky as a kind of physical object that you have to observe and physically understand by doing experiments. You'll just miss the point completely. Rather, you have to identify in a human way uh, with Dostoevsky, the writer, and you have to try to reconstruct his reasons uh, for composing the, the novel as, as, as he did. And Hegel generalizes this uh, not just as an account of how individual human beings uh, 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 engage in activity and why they engage in activity, uh, but uh, he wants to generalize it to uh, whole structures uh, of human uh, activity, uh, uh, whole constructions uh, of human social life. So if you look at the two images on your uh, screen there, it may not be clear, it may be a little bit small. On the left, you've got a coral reef. On the right, you've got an aerial shot of lower Manhattan uh, at night. Um, and in one sense, you could see both of these under the same aspect. You could say, well, look, these are complex structures that are, are thrown up, produced in the course of the development of certain organisms. In the case of the coral reef, you've got these uh, organisms that, that ingest uh, material from the sea, and then that then, they then kind of secrete out in the course of their self-reproduction uh, various kinds of uh, minerals and uh, chemicals to produce the beautiful and highly complex and variegated uh, structures of a coral reef. And in one sense, you could think about the image of Manhattan uh, on, your, on, on your right in something like the same way. Uh, human beings, they collaborate, they organize themselves, their, their, their organisms, their animals, uh, and they, as it were, secrete out uh, these complicated uh, structures, a secretion, if you will, of our, of our collective effort. But in another sense, Hegel wants to say, if you want to really understand the image on the right, if you want to really understand what you're looking at when you see an image of Lower Manhattan like that and understand what those uh, structures are and what they represent, you can't just think of this as a purely um, uh, empirical secretion 
a, a concretization of kind of instincts uh, and, and biologically given drives that interact chemically uh, in a certain way uh, with the environment uh, of, of the sea, uh, with the chemicals in, in, in seawater. Uh, you've got to see the structures on the right-hand side in, in Lower Manhattan as the outgrowths of human strivings, things that were built for reasons, things that have the shape and structure they have because human beings created them with some conscious conception of what they were doing, right? So you see on the right there in the, in, in the image of Manhattan, you see bridges, or you see on the left of that picture, the Freedom Tower, right? If you want to understand what the Freedom Tower is, why it was built there, and with the particular shape that it has, you have to see that um, in relation to 9-11, uh, and, and, and the destruction of the Twin Towers in, in, in 2001. Um, uh, these are things that you can't fully understand empirically. You have to understand their meaning to the people who created them and built them uh, for reasons, right? And, and Hegel thinks a purely empirical scientific observational approach is going to be completely unhelpful. May may work for the coral reef, but it won't work for understanding what you're looking at in the right-hand picture, right? So again, the insufficiency of empirical analysis is crucial uh, for, for Hegel. You, you've got to understand human structures in a different way by identifying with the agents who engage in activity for certain kinds of uh, reasons, and you have to interpret their reasons and bring to light, elucidate the significance uh, uh, and character of the resulting structures in those terms. And science doesn't give you uh, an appropriate model for that kind of uh, uh, analysis. Now, um, Hegel uh, takes these two insights um, and, and builds them into a, a really remarkable uh, and very, very daring metaphysical apparatus, only parts of which I'm going to be able to uh, put before you. Uh, but I want to identify one particularly important metaphysical idea, uh, one that Hegel gets from some of the early Romantic thinkers and early 19th century thinkers, um, uh, because it will help, I hope, to uh, give you at least an overview of what Hegel uh, is up to. And I want to particularly mention uh, a, a very, very uh, bold metaphysical idea uh, that he gets, uh, among other sources, from uh, among other sources, from the great German playwright Gotthold Lessing. This is something that has been pointed out by an intellectual historian, uh, the late Elie Kduri, uh, points out that this was very, very um, influential on Hegel. <coughs> Lessing writes in 1780 uh, a book rarely read today, certainly in the, in, in, in the United States, but it's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, Lessing writes a book in 1780 called The uh, Education of the Human Race. And in it, he endorses a form of pantheism. Uh, pantheism is the view that God is identical with the universe. He, uh, God is not separate from the universe, but fully present uh, uh, within it. God is one and the same. God just is the universe. Uh, pan, just meaning here, all. Uh, uh, and so the idea is to think of God as uh, and the universe as not two separate things, uh, not something that God creates, but, to, but rather to see the universe as indeed uh, God uh, himself. This discussion of pantheism really gets going, by the way, as a result of the work of Spinoza, Dutch uh, uh, philosopher, important in the uh, 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century. Um, uh, and it's because of Spinoza that these, these pantheistic ideas get widely discussed at the time. But Lessing puts it in a way that is particularly uh, helpful, I submit, in understanding what Hegel's doing. And in the education of, of the human race, and I'm summarizing in and in in putting it in terms that probably Lessing wouldn't himself use, but this is the general idea. Um, Lessing basically asks you to think of yourself uh, looking at a, a picture of yourself in a mirror. You're staring at a mirror and you, you see your own image in the mirror. Now, with, with the mirrors that we're familiar with, all you see is a physical uh, uh, representation of your outward exp uh, outward. Um, appearance, right? The, the, what you see in the mirror when you look at yourself in the morning is just an image. It's not the real you. It, it, it's just a kind of reflection of, uh, of, of you, a, a physical appearance. Um, but imagine, Lessing says, that we had a special uh, magic mirror uh, that didn't just represent uh, your physical appearance, didn't just reflect back to you uh, your, your physical coordinates, uh, but rather reflected and duplicated everything about you, 
your goals, your achievements, your identity, everything that you are, everything that makes you uh, who you are, your aspirations, your goals, the whole shebang, right? Imagine that you had a mirror that was uh, like that, Lessing says. Uh, such a, a kind of magic mirror would not just uh, uh, reflect back to you an image of your physical appearance, it would also reveal or disclose your true identity. It would, it would reveal everything about who and what you are. And Lessing's pantheistic hypothesis is, well, suppose we think of the relationship between God and the universe as like that, right, such that the universe is basically God's magical mirror. Right. The, on that hypothesis, this is the pantheistic hypothesis I'm trying to draw your attention to, um, the world, the universe, and everything that happens within it reflect, to God, reflect God's nature back to God. So on that kind of view, the world is thus a reflection of God and, and, and is in that sense, at the same time, completely identical with God. The universe is, as it were, uh, the vehicle for God's own self-revelation for God's own uh, self-understanding and self-comprehension. In, in looking at the universe, God is simply seeing himself, but not just an image of himself. He's seeing the whole thing. He's seeing himself, right? Um, so on that kind of pantheistic view, which uh, Hegel takes over, although he amends it in a variety of ways, God is thus completely identical, in, identical with the universe. Uh, God is Im immanent, uh, to use the, 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 the philosophical term, immanent in everything, not distinct from, apart from, or uh, transcendent uh, from that world, but rather completely implicit within that image that the universe uh, reflects back, right? That's uh, Lessing's uh, uh, remarkable uh, pantheistic idea. And Hegel takes over something like that metaphysical idea, but he adapts it in, in, in an important way. Uh, most importantly, Hegel's philosophical theory is not, not directly focused on uh, an idea of God, although God certainly plays a role uh, in his mature philosophy. Uh, rather, um, Hegel postulates a different kind of entity, something that he calls the world spirit, the Weltgeist is the German word, or simply just Geist. And Geist, it's related etymologically to the English word ghost, it's related to the word spirit, uh, and it's also, of course, in German, and this is what makes it hard to render completely faithfully in English, it's also connected to the word, word mind, right? So Geist is, in part, uh, the German word for the mental. So there's a, there's a kind of incorporation of the mental, the spiritual, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, ghostly, if you will, uh, in this one uh, concept. And Hegel basically asks us uh, to think of the world as a reflection, like Lessing's magic mirror, of this postulated world spirit. And, and Hegel invites us to consider, it's a very daring, bold idea, and of course at a certain level it's, it's nuts, it's crazy, um, and you'll see in a moment that uh, Marx agrees that it's nuts and crazy, but we'll get to that in a moment. He invites us to consider human history as the story of a world spirit trying to identify, recognize, and understand itself in its own self-working out across time, right? That's Hegel's basic idea. Very hard idea, very interesting idea, uh, 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 but that's that, that's what we're dealing with, right? So as Hegel understands this, this, this notion of spirit or a world spirit that he postulates, uh, much like Lessing's pantheistic God, Hegel's world spirit is both the subject and object of a certain kind of truth and knowledge in the following sense. On the one hand, Hegel wants to say, uh, uh, what drives history forward is this world spirit's desire to achieve knowledge of itself, to fully understand itself in the world. And in that sense, viewed from that standpoint, spirit, this Weltgeist, is the doer behind the deeds of world history. It's the motor uh, that is uh, 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 driving uh, historical development uh, forward. The story of, 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 of human history is the story of this abstract entity uh, that Hegel's calling the world uh, spirit. But it's also, and this is where the Lessing hypothesis really kicks in, uh, spirit is also the object of that knowledge. It's, it's both the doer behind the deeds, 
But in, in, it's also the thing that, it, that spirit is trying itself to understand. Um, in pursuing knowledge and understanding of the world through history, uh, the world spirit is not seeking knowledge of some alien external thing. Rather, it's simply seeking self-knowledge. It's simply seeking knowledge of itself. Um, uh, this is a hard idea. If you're having trouble getting your hands around, it's not your fault. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, trust me, that is Hegel's, Hegel's idea. Uh, one way to maybe think about it, those of you who are Christians and familiar with Christian theology, you might think of it this way. Hegel's conception of the world spirit is a bit like Christian Trinitarianism without God and uh, uh, without God, uh, Father and Son, it should say God and Son, you know, God and Jesus, right? Um, I mean, in Christian Trinitarianism, there's God, there's Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And basically what Hegel is saying, look, forget God and the Son for the time being, and just think about the Spirit, right? I mean, you, you know, Christians think about the Holy Spirit as uh, providence, as as God's will, kind of working itself out historically through uh, 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 time, right? And and Hegel is basically saying, well, my world spirit is just like that, but don't worry too much about Jesus and God. Just focus on the Holy Spirit side of the story. Just just think about human history as something in which this spirit is manifest and immanent and developing over time. If you can get that thought, you're on the way to grasping what Hegel's after. So uh, another way to think about it is to think of Hegel as saying world history is a kind of narcissism of the world spirit. It's spirit's quest for self-consciousness, to, un to understand itself, to understand its idea, uh, as he sometimes uh, uh, puts it. So that gives us Hegel's basic proposal. Uh, and again, it's a very bold, difficult to understand idea. It's, it's deeply metaphysical. Uh, world history needs to be understood, Hegel thinks, as the autobiography of a single universal entity, the world spirit or mind, uh, in its successive efforts to achieve its self-realization and self-understanding. And the story of human history in, in Hegel's um, uh, philosophy uh, is the story by which this world spirit becomes conscious of its own nature. And world history, the events that make up world history, uh, that's the, that's the theater, the stage on which spirit's self-consciousness uh, unfolds. Philosophy for Hegel is just the intellectual effort to elucidate this spiritual uh, self-consciousness. But since for Hegel, as you know by now, spirit is an inherently historical entity, and this of course connects up with what I was saying before about reason as a temporal thing, uh, as always involving a to and fro, as a dialectical exchange that occurs over time. Similarly, philosophical understanding for Hegel must itself be fundamentally historical. It must always be the elaboration of a zeitgeist, right? Zeitgeist is just the you know, German concatenation. Zeit is the word for time, and geist is the word for spirit or mind, right? So uh, the philosopher is always trying to decode, decrypt uh, uh, the spirit of the world as it exists at a particular historical uh, moment, in a particular historical epoch. And that's just what a zeitgeist uh, uh, means. You've, you will have heard that term, of course, uh, in ordinary language. Um, Hegelians often describe themselves as doing speculative uh, philosophy, and the word speculative here um, uh, uh, can uh, lead one astray if one focuses on some of its ordinary connotations today, because for us, we often think of speculation as implying conjectural, right, or guesswork, or something tentative, but that's not uh, what Hegel and his followers mean when they describe themselves as doing speculative philosophy. Remember the word speculative is from the Latin word speculum, which means image or mirror or looking glass, right? And that's the right way to understand what Hegel means. Uh, spirit and the philosophical elucidation of the zeitgeist is spirit looking into itself as if uh, like Lessing's mirror, and finding itself. So Hegelian philosophy is speculative because it represents spirit looking into itself and coming to an understanding of itself. And Hegel thinks that by using this metaphysical framework, you can retrieve all of the things that philosophy and philosophers have traditionally sought. So on Hegel's account, spirit self-consciousness is the locus of truth and knowledge because on his story, 
uh, the development of the spirit just is the world. There is no other truth, right? Uh, uh, that's all there is to understand. So in, in, in understanding spirit self-consciousness, we achieve truth, uh, uh, knowledge of truth. Um, it's the locus of reason for Hegel because the historical process uh, by, which the, by which the world spirit achieves self-consciousness is, he thinks, a rational one. Right? It's something that is guided by spirit's reasons. Right? Think again of the coral reef and Manhattan. Right? Manhattan represents for him uh, the reasons why spirit has organized itself in the late 20th, early 21st century in that form, in the architecture uh, and structure of a modern complex city uh, like New York. Right? So history is moved and guided by reason, and that again recalls this point I was trying to uh, make uh, earlier about reason being historical uh, uh, and time-bound. Spirit self-consciousness is also the locus of meaning and significance, because spirit seeks not only to understand itself inertly or descriptively, but rather to affirm itself as something good. And Hegel also thinks, as you know from your reading, uh, that spirit self-consciousness is the locus of freedom, because world history, as he understands it, is the story of spirit's realization and self-emancipation, overcoming its own limitations. Now, if this seems all completely crazy, and, and, and maybe it does, maybe it is completely crazy, there is, I think, a part of this that makes good sense, and, and you, can, you can recover what Hegel is, is after, uh, by thinking about our own autobiographical self-consciousness. Suppose you're asking yourself the question, who are you, right? Who am I, right? How am I to be identified? Uh, how am I, Colin Bird, to think of myself, right? Uh, and I'm asking that question in a kind of autobiographical way. And Hegel thinks, and this is the view that he's basically generalizing, that cannot be a static, abstract question, right? I'm, I can only ever ask the question, who am I, Right? By thinking about, a, by, by, by engaging in that kind of reflection at a particular moment in my life and asking, well, who have I become in relation to what I used to be? Right? The only way to make progress with the question, who am I, is to think of me as a temporal being, as, as an autobiographical being with a past, a present, and a potential future. We've always got to understand ourselves, not in terms of a kind of static being, but in terms of a dynamic becoming, right? You can never answer that question help helpfully in an abstract way. You always and only ask that question uh, from some particular moment in one's life, looking back, right? And when you do this, you're always going to be thinking about your life and your identity um, in relation to implicit conceptions of successive life phases that you've gone through as, ra as a rational being, right? You can't help but understand yourself narratively in terms of a succession of phases, one after the other, that has constituted your life as it's developed uh, over time. Uh, and, of course, there will also be, because we're rational beings, uh, there will also be an element of uh, uh, attention to the reasons we have for being the way we are now compared to how we were before. Think of a person who's had a kind of religious crisis, right? They were raised in, in a religious tradition, but, but a variety of experiences leave, leads them uh, to uh, lose their faith. They have a crisis of faith, um, and, and they move to a different phase. They abandon, they don't go to church anymore. They give up on their religious faith, right? Um, if you're trying to explain how such a person, or if that person themselves is trying to explain to themselves, well, why am I now not going to church at this stage in my life, right? The only way you can give an account of that, Hegel thinks, and surely he's right about this up to a point, is to think about the reasons why you had faith for a period in, in time, why you, find, why you found certain religious practices helpful to you in coping with the struggles of existence, and then why... Uh, you acquired reasons to give up that faith, what it was that led you to abandon uh, your faith, right? And in engaging in that kind of autobiographical reflection on thinking about the reasons why you, you, your life took a certain form, followed a certain trajectory, you're thinking in a Hegelian way. You're thinking of your life as a kind of dialectic of becoming, uh, in which you go through certain kinds of phases, uh, you understand that at a certain time in your life it was rational for you to be a certain way, but in the face of experience, coping with the challenges of life, you acquired new reasons to reject that 
uh, uh, way of being, and you moved to a different phase in which you abandoned your religious faith, say, uh, and operated on a different kind of basis, right? And if you're engaging in that kind of uh, reflection, you're thinking about who you are by thinking about who you've become. Right? And you're thinking about who you've become in relation to some conception of your reasons for becoming the kind of person that you are. Um, and on Hegel's view, you can only understand the rationality of these progressions in retrospect. Right? You can only look back from where you currently are in the sequence and think about where you've come from and why where you are now is rational in relation to what, what, where you came from. And Hegel's uh, uh, philosophical uh, position basically generalizes that uh, kind of uh, uh, autobiographical uh, uh, rational understanding to the entire species. Uh, and of course, what makes it difficult is then, then you, you, you're, you're being asked to accept a very big metaphysical uh, uh, postulate uh, that we can think of the whole of human history as, in, as, as, as the... Uh, effort on the part of this postulated world spirit, this fully inclusive uh, autobiographical entity that somehow stands for the whole of human history. Uh, uh, it's the story of that entity uh, that the philosopher tries to uh, understand. And of course, that further step uh, to the generalization of this picture of autobiographical self-understanding, that's where the, 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 the thing becomes very hard to understand. But that's definitely what Hegel means, right? I always like the, when I think about Hegel, you know, the Universal Pictures logo that, that, that appears uh, at the beginning of every Universal Picture uh, movie that they've produced, right? There it is uh, on your little gif there going round and round, right? That's like, a, that's almost like an image of the Hegelian world spirit. All of those little points of light, they represent everything that there is in the world and it's universal. And what the, what the, what the, what the philosopher is trying to do in decoding uh, the world spirit is to understand how over the course of human history, this, this world spirit um, has gone through a succession of phases that represent rational progress through historical time. And that's the basic, that's the basic uh, Hegelian picture. I hope that helps you a little bit to make sense of uh, Hegel's view. Uh, uh, I've done my best. Um, uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, explain absolutely every phrase in your difficult reading, uh, but uh, hopefully that gives you enough. Um, since we're only reading Hegel in this class for the sake of understanding Marx, all I think we really need to understand to make the uh, transition to the lectures for next week is to, to think about how Marx basically absorbed and reacted to this uh, Hegelian view. And like many intellectuals of his generation, Marx is overwhelmingly impressed by the Hegelian project, and especially by its dialectical integration of philosophical and historical understanding. And that's an aspect of the Hegelian view that Marx never abandons. And he says it very, very clearly in a little note that he added, uh, scribbled in the margin to uh, uh, the manuscript of the German ideology, which we'll be reading next week. Marx says in that little note, it's a little scribble, we know only one science, the science of history. There is no science that is non-historical. Um, and that part of the Hegelian project, Marx completely takes over from Hegel. But Marx also has a deep reservation about the Hegelian approach, and I submit that this is a, 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 an objection or a reservation or a misgiving that you are very likely to share. Marx is deeply unimpressed by the metaphysical extravagance of Hegel's approach, this postulation of a kind of global universal world spirit of which we're all somehow uh, a part. Uh, and what he's reacting against there, and I suspect you'll share this uh, negative reaction, is that Hegel's approach seems to reduce the meaning of human lives, the meaning of, of historical epochs, uh, human practices, just to the level of mere pawns for the realization of a kind of non-human idol, an abstraction, this, this, this abstraction of the world spirit. And Hegel uses language, uh, even in the thing that you read, which will be likely very off-putting to you. Uh, so he talks about the means spirit uses to realize its idea. And who are the means the spirit uses to realize its idea? Well, it's us. We're all just kind of pawns uh, in this unfolding of the spirit. 
right? And, and Hegel also talks in this context somewhat disturbingly about the slaughter bench of history, right? We're all just means towards the realization of this grand, bigger, universal uh, world spirit. Um, and Marx very, very strongly resists this subordination of the worth and meaning and rationality and value of human lives and human freedom uh, to the realization of this uh, uh, idol, this, this, this metaphysical abstraction of the world spirit. So uh, Marx uh, uh, basically accepts Hegel's background assumption that truth, rationality, and freedom are historical all the way down. They're always time-bound. They're always dialectical. But Marx rebels against the idea that that, his, that that historical progression is just the story of a spiritual or mental or ideational narrative of self-consciousness. Rather, what matters, Marx says, is not the emancipation of some metaphysical spectral world mind. Rather, what matters in human history is the struggle of flesh and blood material human beings to live and provide for themselves. And that's why Marx thinks we need a new materialism to take over from Hegel this insight about the inherently and necessarily historical realization of freedom. But we mustn't think of it as the realization of the freedom of some non-human abstraction, like a world spirit. Rather, we have to think of it as the realization of human freedom. So it's no longer in Marx the emancipation and self-realization of the world spirit that comes to matter. Rather, it's the realization and emancipation of material human beings that comes to matter. And if, you've got, if you can get that basic idea, you've basically got your way into Marx's theory. So I'll stop there for now. Uh, sorry, I've gone on a little bit too long, but hopefully that was helpful. Good luck.